Hey, one more thing before you go. What is the meaning of death when you have lost so many loved ones, including 11 people, in just one year alone? Is there a path to healing through all of that? When faced with the reality of losing someone or something you love strikes again by an unnecessary war in Ukraine, let's say, where do you start to manage that grief? Stay tuned. We're going to answer these questions and more when we explore the story of one woman who has experienced all of that and is going to share with you that journey and how you too can heal if you're going through the same thing. I'm your host, Michael Hurst. Welcome to One More Thing Before You Go. My guest in this episode is Victoria Rader. She's a PhD, possibility coach, transformational speaker, and founder of You Two Shine. She empowers she entrepreneurs and coaches and people that seek personal development to grow in all areas of their life through proven formulas of success so that they can have more peace, purpose, and prosperity. Welcome to the show, Victoria. Thank you so much, Michael. It's already wonderful to be here. You have an amazing journey. And uh, I know that you, uh, in your journey, you like to uh, help people move forward in life in a very positive way. And I think from where you have come from, the things that you have uh, experienced not aren't necessarily in a book. Um, you come from life experience, and you know, as a in my personal life, and as a police retired police officer, you know, my life dealt a lot with uh, death and unexpected death. And, uh, you know, uh, relaying those messages or being with somebody when they passed and nobody else was with them. Um, you know, they're asking me to deliver messages to their loved ones and so forth. So I'm familiar with death from those perspectives, as well as personal loss. Um, but man, you, you really, you have a journey. <laughs> you have a journey with this. You know, very much so. Even as you um, refer to that, you know, what comes to mind is this common conscious phrase that people actually will say, I'm dying to do it, or I would die to get it. You know, just all of a sudden, as you're saying it, that phrase comes to mind, and I'm thinking the whole purpose of death and the process of dying is so that we give ourselves permission to say, I am living to do it. <laughs> I That's am good. living to be that, you know, because death truly has one purpose, and that is to redefine our awareness of the gift of life. And Very we nice. refuse, refuse, refuse to learn it. And so that's been the gift of death in my life, you know, um, of experiencing all aspects of it. You know, that's, that's brilliant, actually. I love that. I, you know, when you when you deal with death, whether it be from a personal level or professional level, sometimes you get jaded by that. You know, in my line of work, that's what happened to me as a cop. I mean, you cannot you cannot lose your emotions when dealing with death in that regard, because there are there there are people there that are counting on you as an officer to give them comfort and help them through that situation. So I love what you just said. I think that uh, I'm going to look at <laughs> all my experiences with a little different perspective now. Um, <laughs> excuse me. I like to start at the beginning. Can um, we talk about where did you grow up? Yeah, I was born in the former Soviet Union in Ukraine and went to school there. Um, then actually got to visit uh, US after the Iron Curtain fell and then went back and went to college back in Ukraine and then moved here to the US. But growing up in Ukraine um, as a part of the Soviet Union gave me a gift that I came to realize much later in life. You know, the regime was such, and is inherited with what we see a lot in Russian politics today, right? The, the aggressive um, expansion and control, unfortunately, but the, and the lack of choice. And so that the, the regime's policies of the lack of choice and the lack of presence of freedom externally has given me a gorgeous gift of realization that 
While I couldn't choose which classes to take, I had to take all sciences. While I couldn't choose to leave the city and move somewhere else because I had a stamp in my passport, internal passport, that said Prepiska, which is this is where you live. <laughs> and this is where you <laughs> have to live. You can't really go anywhere. You know, and all of those limitations, what it gave me was, wait a minute, if I retract back within, if I hide within the secret of my sacred self, I call it sacred me, nobody can touch that. Nobody can take away the freedom of this beautiful place inside. And, and it truly was a gift because when, when I found a way to be empowered and protected through going deep within and reconnecting with the source of life there. Now, not with awareness of that was happening, just kind of intuitively. Many years have passed when I could look back and say, ah, that is what's happening. It is that very gift that I get to start the journey with anybody who comes into our businesses family, you know, any you to shine family. Because once you reclaim the inner freedom through connecting to the energy that creates everything, the energy of love, I call it love for me is life originating, vibrant emotion, energy in motion. So if it doesn't add to love, life, it isn't love. It's that easy. Love is very easy. Is it adding to life? If it's adding to life, it's love. <laughs> if it's not, it's mimicking itself as love. So once you connect to that awareness of the presence of love within, you receive peace. Because peace is awareness of that love. And it's the first step with anything. There's no external solution. The Soviet Union taught me that. There are no external solutions. I had to withdraw to find that inner presence and inner peace. Then a miracle happens. The deeper you connect it to peace, the more you realize it's not your job to go shift the universes. It's your job to impact that peace through service and through love to the people near to you. That becomes your very simple, very do doable, practical daily purpose from peace to purpose. And as you live that purpose without being lost that you don't have a higher meaning in life, as you love that purpose, the higher purpose finds you. It gently places you on your path. And as you continue walking that path, prosperity follows. It is that beautiful, intentional, and simple. Most of us say, I want to have more money, how to get more prosperous. That creates inner anxiety. That diminishes our ability to see the path of the purpose. And even if we get the money, right? 78 or 75% of people who win a million dollars three years later get back to the same situation they've started or worse. So even if we get the prosperity financial prosperity out of alignment, it is not permanent. And so that is the gift of growing up back home that I believe I have received without necessarily realizing it until now. That's very profound, actually. And I, I love what you said about purpose. And I can validate a little bit what you're saying with purpose, because I thought my purpose in life, which it was for a time being, was being a police officer mm -hmm. and doing my job. And when that cut short, then I was angry, I was depressed, I was mad that those around me that I trained were now going up, up the ladder. And I was angry for a long time. And I shut myself off. And when I, my daughter had opened my eyes and realized that there was more, and that the people that are around me loved me, and that I needed to reinvent my purpose in life. And that purpose was ignited by the love of my family that brought me out of the anger and the depression and put me in a new direction. So that works. Um, profound, profound. Um, what was your family like, may I ask? Absolutely. I want to talk about family, but I've learned to listen to my intuition, uh, my call and go and go. I'm guided. And if you allow me, I just want to pour into the gorgeous purpose of yours because the expression of your purpose have shifted, but I see you, even though we're new friends, and I see your purpose as creating safe and sacred places. I see you 
as doing that for animals as a kid. I see you as allowing for profound healing to walk your daughter down the aisle after your incident because you were going to be a great dad and create a safe space for your girl. I see mm -hmm. you on every thing, single thing you've done as a police officer. It wasn't about getting the bad guys. It was about creating safety for those that were hurt. And I see you today. I feel you today on this podcast. You're creating a safe space, not only for me as your host, but for that soul that is hearing this. And what is coming through for both of us is that, no, the purpose is the same. The expressions of that purpose are infinite. And it's so important for me to have said that um, and to have shared it with you because I think it's a gorgeous validation and realization. <laughs> Thank you. That means a lot. That touched me. That that touches my soul. I almost I almost brought a tear. <laughs> we well, now my family. Down. Now redirect back to family. Um, I'm very grateful for my family. Uh, my dad and my mom are my heroes. You know, I'm often asked, "Who is the hero in your life?" And it's my time to choke up. We'll take turns crying, Michael. <laughs> this we, this we, topic of this podcast: Who secret. cries first and loudest? <laughs> <laughs> you know. Um, my mom and dad uh, are amazing people. Um, my dad was a journalist. Just give it two moments, two moments of my life to understand who I am because of who they were. My dad was a journalist and he worked for uh, one of the newspapers as covering the sports. It's kind of nice because you don't have to lie as much in the Soviet Union. Very true. Cover sports. <laughs> <laughs> you know, the score is the score. <laughs> But because of his organizational skills, he became the editor in chief uh, for one of the regional newspapers. And he was sent to Chernobyl in 1986 after the nuclear disaster. Chernobyl was a nuclear plant that one of the uh, sectors uh, exploded and there was a leakage of radiation, actually second in its mass um, up to date after the Hiroshima incident. And so, my dad was asked to go to Chernobyl three days after the explosion and report that all was well. So he went to Chernobyl, he came back, and for days he was throwing up with minor, minor uh, nuclear poisoning, radiation poisoning. He's with us, he's well now, and this is obviously um, 30 years back, 30, almost 30 years back. But he refused to say everything is well. He refused to write that report and say everything is well. And we went from a family with a very recognizable social status to a very different lifestyle. And what I've learned was the importance of uh, integrity. And what I got to observe was miracles of integrity that followed. This, this happened 1986 in April. By the end, you know, within a couple of years when the Iron Curtain fell, my dad was invited to be one of the first journalists to go to the U.S. for the exchange of free press because he took a stand. Then he came back to Ukraine and he was one of the first people to start an independent newspaper, privately owned. Up till then, everything was owned by the government. And so when the Soviet Union fell apart, he was one of the first people to own a newspaper. There were a ton of trials and tribulations and all of that, but that's just, that's my dad, right? That's my dad. And my mom for me is a woman who, when I was two and a half and three, both parents were working. I spent summers in the village without indoor plumbing, by the way, <laughs> with well water and no indoor plumbing at my grandma and grandpa's house near wow. Lviv in the little uh, village there. I had severe allergies. We knew nothing about causes of allergies at that time, but somebody told her that carrot juice would help me. And so she would get on the bus for the weekends drive, ride for four hours with a bunch of carrot bags. And there were no juice makers at that time in Ukraine. And so she would grade those carrots by hand. And then she would squeeze the carrot juice for me. And she would have me drink that carrot juice. So my early memories of my mom is with yellow hands. I mean, it's interesting that I'm wearing an orange blouse. That's a color of love for me. The color of love for me is not necessarily red, you know, it's just, it's that carrot juice. And so those were the two parents that I had. And they are the reason why I could overcome any and all trials that was thrown at me because I saw integrity 
and I experienced love. That's amazing. Um, what a what an amazing story. I mean, re- realistically, obviously, as you know, as a as my a police officer, as a human being, and as a police officer, integrity to me is very very important. And you picking that particular story, you know, really touched me because. Um, he stood up on his own integrity. He decided to make sure that he was going to stand on that integrity, and and the universe repaid him. Yeah, That's a perfect example of that. The universe repaid him. That particular ideology of integrity, I think that we've lost across the board, especially lately. We won't go into a political aspect of what's going on today, but I think integrity has lost its has lost its way at least here in the United States to some extent, um, in dealing with individuals that are put into office that that blatantly lie and and it doesn't matter to them. When I hear somebody validate that integrity allowed them to move forward in a way that they were rewarded with the fact that they possessed that and displayed that integrity, um, that makes me feel good. I think that uh, gives me hope. Mm. Do you have any brothers? You know, another, I'm sorry. Oh, I do. You know, I was going to say that another way to look at integrity for me is that um, being a person in integrity is not only, you know, acting from a place of your convictions and beliefs, but in a wholesome way, it is allowing for the part of you that is sacred, the energy that is eternal within you to flow uninhibited through the matter that you are you know all of our products have this little m big e and i'm just passionate about the concept when i say i'm me there is a mortal part of me yes there is we talked about death and yet there is the eternal part of me there is a matter and there is energy there is material and there is essential and there's manifesting and there's expensive so we the duality of our presence here is resolved only through integrity And what is the recipe for that integrity? It's the choice to surrender to love so that a mortal surrenders to eternal, matter to energy, material to essential, and manifesting to expensive. It's a true concept. If if someone listens and allows for it to resonate through them, that is to me what integrity is. Alignment with the power that is within you surrendering to it through love and living from that place and then the actions that are aligned with your thoughts are just a our reflection of that inner integrity that is happening you know that's brilliant that's profound i love that it <clears throat> this is going to be a long conversation <laughs> <laughs> hey the bladder the bladder rules apply <laughs> Uh, the bladder rules apply. I like that. I have to put a little note up here on my computer. It's um, right. Yeah, that's cra- that's crazy cool. So, um, do you have any? I kind of lost lost me for a second there. Um, I know that you're. Do you have any brothers or sisters? Yes, I have an amazing brother. My joke. His name is Alexander Semenyuk. Ukraine, good, good Ukrainian name. And my joke is, there are two of us in the family. We're both authors, but he's also a writer. Now, what do I mean by that? I think every human being is an author. We all are authoring a gorgeous life that we've come to author. And some of us, like me, are called to share it, and then we have to do all kinds of practices to get us to write it. And then there are people like my brother who needs to write as he needs to breathe. Well, I thought my dad. uh, You know, both of our parents are journalists, so he's inherited that ability to just, he expresses himself better, I think, in writing than in any Mm. other medium. Um, And he's on medium for that matter. But anyway, so that's my brother. He is incredibly talented, uh, incredibly unique individual, and I am very very grateful for him in my life uh, are you, is your family here or are they still back in ukraine my mom and dad and my brother are all three here and the rest of my extended family are are spread all over the world really but a lot of them are still in ukraine, in ukraine. um i i relate to what your brother goes through my father was a journalist and i grew up in a newsroom basically um <laughs> literally he would bring me 
five, six, seven years old, eight years old, nine years old, I'd go to work with him and um, I'd be in the middle of the newsroom and there's like 20 desks, 30 desks out there and the there's all these people typing their own stories and I'd watch my dad, you know, hack out a story and yeah, loved it. It was great, you know, growing up in that environment, watching that take place and seeing the creativity. I think it's where my creativity comes from is my father. Um, I wish I could buckle down and write like my father, but I'm working on that. <laughs> yeah, or me like my brother, right? I mean, it's... <laughs> It's one of those things, you're like, yeah, that'd make a great book. And then I go, but then I have to write it. <laughs> uh, yeah, that's life, isn't it? Life. Um, you went to, yeah, I know you, earlier you had mentioned that you uh, went to university. Uh, you have a PhD in metaphysics, correct? Yes, correct. But in Ukraine, I went to Mahila Academy. Um, it was uh, an incredible institution, truly, you know, because it's one of the oldest European um, academies that was shut down. At a time I went there, we celebrated 750th anniversary, but it shut down for the time of the Soviet regime, you know, when um, the Soviet Union was formed. Mm -hmm. It was shut down because it was based on religious and spiritual principles, and there was no God allowed <laughs> such as a presence, yeah. you know. So uh, it reopened, and I was in the second year of it reopening, and the unique offering that it had was even though obviously most schools in Ukraine were in Ukrainian and or Russian for Eastern Ukraine, the academy's main language for most classes was in English because we had professors from all over the world that were coming to help the newly independent Ukraine to restore its great history of education. And so I got so many incredible professors coming from different best schools in the world. You know, my macroeconomics professor was from Stanford. My literature professor was from Harvard. And even though they were all coming just for one semester to pour it in, my greatest benefit of education was my law professor, who's now my husband of 27 years. <laughs> you know? So so I did real well. So you, be, yeah, you, you, got, you, really, you really benefited from going to school. <laughs> really benefited from the academy. <laughs> you know, and that's a story and a podcast in and of itself, really. But um, and then I went and, and I, when I got to, US, to the U.S., I went to George Mason. And then many years later, knowing that practical success was important when you come out of survival and into stability, but that there is greater meaning to life and significance to life and how to help people shift their subconscious mind that controls that. That's what got me into getting, um, you know, a PhD, an online program through Sedona and Phoenix and then California, the Tri University of Metaphysical Studies to understand the philosophy of being of reality and how to start shift, you know, the reality through intention. And that got me into understanding the how the energy works. And I explored so many different energy modalities. So when I founded Our You to Shine Company, I brought all of the practices from just, you know, my upbringing, yes, from years of being in real estate, um, and becoming very successful regardless of recession and homeschooling my kids, you know, bringing all of these things into a formula of saying, because we're a little M and big E, we've got to address both. And so how do I do that? And that's where metaphysics came. Here's a spiritual, energetic way for practical steps and application. Now, this is how you shift your subconscious. This is this conscious steps that you take. And, um, uh, I'm very passionate about it. It brings me amazing, amazing joy to be walking that path. Yeah, when you talk about it, your face lights up. For those that are listening to this podcast, you can see your face light up with it. You have a passion for it and a purpose for it. And I think that you bring that forward in a very positive way. I've listened to you on other podcasts and you know other, um, in, other uh, interviews with you. And each one of them, you bring that energy. And I, I appreciate that. Um, you, especially the metaphysical aspect of it, I think that um, it takes us, it, as human beings, sometimes we have to stop and think that we're all connected. 
and we're all connected through that energy and through that source in that you know nature and not just us as human beings mother nature and us the universe and us we are all connected at some point and intersect at some point so can can we fast forward a little bit to 2013 i know that some notes that you had sent me you um we're all used to losing people you know we we lose a father grandfather mother grandmother grandfather you know aunt uncle child unfortunately sometimes uh, sometimes instantaneously sometimes it's a, a the long goodbye uh cancer Louis body and things like that uh 2013 for you was a very long year can we talk a little bit about that man and how you i'm assuming from from what you learned and were able to integrate, did that help you through all those? Absolutely. And, um, you know, this is the year when every, every month, you know, starting from the end of um, January, I got news about losing a family member or a dear client or closest friend. And even though we won't take up the time of the podcast going through every step, I do want to mention rather briefly, um, the three incidents because I believe they were bri- they were bridges, right? They were bridges into awareness and understanding of, of, of death as such. And the first one was just the shock. I think it's important. A lot of us talk about death and or life, but either death or life starts with a shock. It's very important to understand that, that, you know, a lot of different therapies um, out there start with releasing, you know, either depression or anxiety or anger, which all are secondary emotion. To me, the first emotion is shock, followed by numbness, followed by redirecting into one of those others. And so that shock of death, I mean, baby, uh, for some reason, I have to go to the, when baby is born, imagine baby being born, beginning of your life, you come out of warm, dark, and wet into cooler, bright, and dry. Yeah, you're going to scream and cry. It's not just the air you're getting in. Your body your body's like, shock. I'm in shock. Welcome to the world, you know. And so, but the shock came when my, when the phone call came for us in 2013, at the beginning of the year, when my mom got a call that her sister, relatively young, vibrant, healthy woman, died of a sudden heart attack in Moldova. And so, and, and literally that was the feeling that we felt flying there. The feeling that was very, very present through the the funeral. And, you know, and then my mom went into deeper grieving and I kind of remained in this shock because I couldn't quite process it because the busyness of life was just keeping me busy. And so then when just a few weeks later, my dad came into the house and, you know, usually he would come in. I have three dogs. They run to him. They're happy. You know, there's, at that point it was one. But so my dad comes in and he says, I need you to just sit down a minute. And, you know, we all know, we all know, right? I know something's happened. And remember, I'm still in shock. I'm like in shock about how could it happen? And so I sit down and growing up, there is a very big difference between me and my brother. I'm 12 and a half years older than, 11 and a half years older than he is. But my cousin, also Alex, Alexander, was only two years younger. And for the first seven years of my life, we both lived at my grandma's house, my dad's mom. Then for the summers, I would go to my mom's mom, as I've mentioned. But we were growing up as brother and sister. And when I was going to the U.S., you know, immigrating to the U.S., it was hard for him. And so my dad asking me to kind of sit down and he said, you know, grandma just called and Alex drowned. So it's my cousin who was like a brother to me. I find out that he drowned. The body was already exhausted from the shock that it's been experiencing. And so the waves of emotion were very powerful for me. You know, the grief and I didn't go through five classic stages. It just, it just, I was overwhelmed. And I did the one thing I knew how I said, okay, I, I need to process because at that point I'm wrapping up my real estate. I'm opening my you to shine company. I'm homeschooling my children. My husband travels a lot. I have life. I have life. And I said, okay, I've got to function while grieving. How do I do that? I go to the one technique 
of breathing and meditating that I take my clients through. And I sit down for what I now understand was a sacred gift from the universe, you know, God's presence, however you refer to, to the, what I'm going to describe. So I sit down to meditate. Now, a lot of us think of meditation as a way it should be. If you sit down, you close your eyes and you say, I intend to meditate, whatever then happens, happens. Don't be attached to anything. Thoughts bombarding you, great. Keep breathing, right? So I'm sitting down, close my eyes, I go deeper into meditation, and all of a sudden I feel and experience and almost see, not physically, but in my mind's eye, the clarity and the crispness of the water, the side of the water. I'm not yet putting the two together. And then I feel as if I'm leaving the water and I'm going up, up, up and into the brilliant light and I'm surrounded by so much love and so much comfort and so much meaning and I have a very strong feeling first the phrase I am okay and then life continues life is and then realization that what I've experienced was the last moments of my cousin's life physical life and the first moment of him re-entering into the spiritual life. And I got to tell you, I couldn't, there's a guilty part of us that when it doesn't mourn, it feels uncomfortable. I couldn't make myself mourn him. I just had this phenomenal gift of peace. And I actually experienced guilt about it. I was like, what is wrong with me? Am I a narcissist? I'm not feeling emotion. I feel happy. I feel joyful about a death my brother, my, my cousin experienced. I had to work through that. I had to give myself permission to be healed internally, to trust the process of life to such degree. That gift was given me so early on because of the other deaths that follow. And then I was able to learn how to help those beautiful souls to cross over into the light. That year was a year of incredible education of the barriers between life and death and what my role is in witnessing the meaning of life and release of guilt and release of any limitation of experiencing death through anything other than honoring life that it frames. And then there was another pivotal moment when halfway through the year in August, my best um, Kiv Mahila Academy friend, Anya, my best, best friend called me and she said, hey, Vika, I just got diagnosed with stage four throat cancer. Can you help me heal? And I said, sure, let's see what we can do. Let's do a session. I tune into her energy and I see her being surrounded by this immense light and yes, you know, the presence of angelic beings, however you constructed it, this is how my brain saw it and perceived it. And I see her walking into that light. So I know, I know that healing for her is not the healing that she thinks is for her. And I simply tell her, I said, Anichka, I can promise you, you will have an immense healing of peace. She died the following morning, but she fell asleep after that session in peace. And so, so often in our life, we, instead of allowing for life fully and completely and trusting its process, that our fear of death limits our ability to live. So most of us don't live to live. We live not to die. And that year, 2013, has helped me redefine what it is that I've come to help me, my family, my clients to truly do with this precious time we have on the earth. And that is permission, purpose, ability to live life without fear of dying, but through men's joy of the experience of life. That story brought um, some interesting feelings towards me. I think that's amazing that you had that experience on both ends of that. It, had you had you in the past had any type of a, um, I, I guess it, that's a, would be a mediumship or, or some psychic 
intuition in regard to that? It, was this the first time it was presented to you? I, you know, we all have, without an exception, all of us have um, intuitive abilities, psychic abilities. The damage <coughs> life has done for us, what I'm shown for you is that you've always known the safest way to go as a cop. You couldn't explain it. <laughs> Back to yeah. the calling. We all have them. We all have them. They're numbed for a lot of us through different, you know, traumas. So I had very uh, acute psychic abilities. I didn't know that's what they were. I didn't know what they were. I couldn't identify them. Speaking of death, um, it was the death of a friend's father who I could intuitively foresee and didn't know what to do with that information that stopped mm. me from pursuing them as a student and just numbing it all, <laughs> numbing it all, throwing myself into religion and then combining the two together, finding the gorgeous medium to walk on. Yeah, I think society as a whole, um, we're starting to come around a little bit more, but I think society in general uh, kind of prevents us from that because they don't want to, to understand why we may see something like that or why we talk to somebody on the other side or why we're, we're able to see angels. Um, you know, and if you tell somebody that, well, I talk to my angels all the time, they kind of give you this weird little stink eye like. <laughs> You'll be next door to Napoleon in a mental institution. Exactly. You know? <laughs> this is your room with the angels. This is your room with conquering the rest of the world. It's, it's exactly. Both are equally important, by the way. Both are equally important to be loved. Yeah, they are. <laughs> uh, but yes, it is, I think society, uh, again, we're, with more education, I think that we're able to, uh, and more inspiration and motivation, like what we're presenting today, it allows people to understand that uh, the possibility does exist. You just have to open your heart, open your mind, and open your eyes a little bit, and open your ears, and and listen to what what's inner within you. And uh, I love how you presented the idea of live to love, um, not to die. You know, live life, live to love, live to live, not live to die. Um, mm. That's profound. That's a brilliant statement, because the majority of us, without realizing it, we're living to not die, and not the other way around. I mean, even me, I, I have a disease that I have to manage. So every day, I I uh, manage it with, uh, believe it or not, I manage it with diet and with exercise and with meditation. I make an intent, but I'm not making an intent. I I guess. I have to admit, when you bringing that statement up, I'm doing that so that I can extend my life. Um, so I guess I'm kind of unconsciously doing the same thing. But you know, I feel that I have much more to give to the world. I don't want to leave right now. I feel that I I need to walk my second daughter down the aisle. I want to spend, I want to travel with my wife. I, you know, I mean, there's so many things I still want to do, and I think sometimes that present prevents us, but. Then again, if you look at trying to do all of that, that is living to live. That's living life by walking your daughter down the aisle or yeah. being there for your son when, when, they, when they marry somebody or uh, make an achievement or graduate college or you know, traveling, experiencing history or culture or just food. Food, I like food. <laughs> <laughs> Who doesn't? <laughs> um, so yeah, I think uh, that well, that's a very profound statement. I think that we all have that innate ability to do that, and I, I agree with you when you brought back the fact that um, in my lifetime I have learned to process death in a different way. So because of that, when I lost people personally, it was very difficult for me to even cry, and because it was indoctrinated into me that you can't cry in front of everybody. Not necessarily because I'm a man, but especially in my in my profession, you know, you. you you have to stay strong. You have to present this image for somebody and be there for them. So, you know, even though every time I delivered a death message and somebody collapsed and, and you know, I, I wanted to cry, instead I went to my patrol car, then I got emotional kind of a thing. Um, I'm pointing to my patrol car back there. You can't see that. <laughs> but you, you know what I mean? It, it's a situation, I think, in society we... We shouldn't have to give ourselves permission to, if we understand it from a different perspective. 
and I know that you've come you've come way past that and you understand it wholeheartedly. But for those people that are watching this and listening to this, I think that we we should be able to understand and go through the grieving process, um, not necessarily by the book of rules, but how we feel about the situation. Um, do you agree with that? Oh, I agree on a very deep, profound level, you know, and um, I know you and I were kind of talking about books, but I want to want to tell you that the way the conversation, the way conversation is guided um, years ago, you know, we've uh, created and we're constantly adding to it a little app. It's called empower dash me. It's spelled empower dash little ambiguity. Big on that concept. You know, no, we're good. We're talking about why is it coming into my awareness now? Because one of the subsets or categories in that app is called my grief. And what I found in my work with my clients is that there are 99 that I could identify aspects of grief. Wow. Aspects, 99 emotions. And so, do I have it here? And so what, the way the app is built, when you take the phone, it's very in, built intuitively, energetically to tune in. And then when you shake the phone or click on it, it gives you the aspect of grief that is hidden within you to validate it so you can process, then it gives you a visualization for your brain because your brain doesn't know the difference mm -hmm. between visualized and real. And I usually tell people an example with a lemon. Imagine you're biting into a lemon, bite deeper and deeper and deeper. How did your throat feel? Okay, that's how your brain doesn't know the difference. It really doesn't. But what it does is it val it goes through the release. And I'm, I'm clicked on my phone to find the one that's aligned for the episode. It'll take us 30 mm -hmm. seconds. And then the healing gives you a validation affirmation. So you can have it in your sacred space. I created it for me. The reason I'm saying it is everything I've ever written, created, and done, or my team has, has been, I want help. I can't find it. I'm going to make it. <laughs> you know, so. The mother of invention. Yeah. Here is what I, this is when I ask the app intuitively, what is something that we at this moment of this episode, as majority of the family of listeners needs, what comes in is validate, I'm bewildered as to why. So I'm showing it for most of us, and it doesn't have to be death. Grief is a loss of opportunity. We are grieving as humanity. Yep. We are grieving as humanity. We'll, if we feel we've lost something or something's been taken away, what I'm showing is that for a lot of us, the energy is why. I'm bewildered as to why. So when I invite you to visualize with me, it'll be 30 seconds, close your eyes. With your eyes closed, imagine a cloudy sky. Then imagine as if a gentle, steady wind is blowing and clearing the sky from all the clouds. See the clear sky, see the sunlight. Allow for the light to come to your heart and light it within. Imagine that that light spreads through your whole body. Have firm with your hand on your heart. Confusion leaves. I now see a bigger picture. I am trusting. I'm hopeful. I'm me. Now, you didn't have to spend $200 on a therapist. This was a um, profound, deep healing for the feeling of bewilderment. Right. So mm. 90, 99 aspects that I found and they're intuitively guided. So that's what popped into, you know, my mind when we talked about the grief and the grieving. We are grieving as humanity and grief mm. prevents us from manifesting, from creating, from thriving. So, yeah, that that was amazing, actually. Thank you for for doing that. I think that that's a perfect <laughs> example for an opportunity for us to be able to uh, grasp onto something that we maybe not do not understand, but we can innately feel within ourselves because while well, you we were talking about that and while I was doing it, I could feel it, not just see it, I could feel it. And that's important, yeah. I think, for us to really uh, grow, take hold of that understanding and to be able to utilize mm -hmm. it. What a brilliant, that's a brilliant app. I'm gonna get that. <laughs> I'm going to have to get Please do. App. Please do. You will <laughs> love it. I use it every day. It has three-minute meditations that create. <laughs> uh, you know, I, I, th there's one thing in my journey that I have learned. I have learned to slow down. You know, it's the old cliche, take the time to stop and smell the roses. 
Mm. You know, I have taken, I used to be a triple type A personality. Um, <laughs> I did. <laughs> you know, my wife, I, I could listen, I could watch TV, read a book and do something else all at the same time. You should drive my wife nuts. Um, mm. I have learned to, to really take the time in life to really reflect on the inside of me. Meditation has helped me quite a bit, actually. What you just presented to us gives each and every one of these individuals out here in this in this audience family, this podcast family, the opportunity for them to, to um, each and every day be motivated and be inspired and to um, understand intuitively that that's unique. And I want to know how that works intuitively for that app to be able to give us a message that we can use as a mantra for the day. Mm -hmm. that, that's fantastic. It's, it's, you know, it's since we're down that path, you know, I got to tell you, it's got a daily blessing. You can have a blessing. It has freedom statement. It has grief. It has money laws. It has answers. But my favorite part <laughs> is the three minute meditations because <laughs> they're guided and they're, they're all, meditations that have been used as healings over two decades of me doing it and the one that comes to mind we're not going to play it because it is three minutes but is receiving good news because what happens is the common consciousness has trained us that no no news is good news how damaging is that it's because we're so used to know yeah. that any news that comes is bad news and so our brain actually is programmed to listen, to tune in, and to bring bad news. So that three-minute meditation rewires your brain to open it to good news. And this is the one we get so much feedback on because people are like, oh, this is spooky. I just did your meditation, and I got a call, and, and I'm like, I don't know, it just works. I don't know all the ins and outs. I'm guided. I'm doing it. just works. The universe. <laughs> the universe it puts it where it's supposed to be. Um, yeah, that's yeah. brilliant. It, it, it's the only analogy that, um, like when a cop knocks on your door, the people on the inside go, okay, what happened? Yeah. That's the first question. No, ma no matter what, it could, it's always what happened. Um, so yeah, it's, uh, yeah, that's pretty cool. Because think of it instead of, instead of the negative side of good, the news, what kind of news is coming to me, look for the positive side of what news can I expect that's positive for me? That's yeah. great. That goes right along with that app. I love that app. We're going to get that app as soon as we get off of here. <laughs> I, hope, I hope you love it. If you love it one hundredth of how much I love it, we are doing some We're great We're doing stuff. well. Oh, it, it, just to touch really quick on here, I know that um, we, we to emphasize the little M and the, the big E. So when you see that in the show notes, that is not a typo. That is intentional. The little M, the big E. Correct? Absolutely. Because we want to remember that the mortal matter is teeny, but eternal energy is huge. <laughs> this is, we have, we're going to have to have another conversation down the road just about <laughs> that in particular, the metaphysical aspect of everything. Yeah. I know that we're here to help people understand death and life and death and how they're, mm -hmm. how they intertwine. Death is is always inevitable. Sometimes it's unfortunately in, you know, an unexpected death. Um, again, or as I said earlier, sometimes it's a long goodbye, but either one of them, um, to help us understand that we have the ability to work through that death and that loss, but it's not the end. I think is a very important factor that the energy, our energy, our soul energy continues on and that um, our physical body may be gone, but our energy continues to move forward. So like your vision with, the, with mm -hmm. the person, you know, your friend, your best friend with the, with the cancer, you know, it's it, what an amazing vision that you have because it gave you peace of mind to know that she was going to be taken care of from an energetic perspective and that her soul was going to continue to move forward and without the pain that she's feeling right now. You know, and, and what uh, what is offered kind of into into my awareness now for us to explore is one of the mm -hmm. many death learning episodes in my life was when um, my dear sister in law 
is also a very close friend of mine. You know, her name is Nanda. I just, I love her. She's from Brazil. And a few years back, her little niece fell into the pool and was drowning. It's drowning steam, huh? And uh, we have witnessed a lot of miracles through healing where her life was expended for many months, but then she still crossed over at the end. And that's an interesting thing. And, and you've mentioned several times, you know, sometimes it takes a while. And so I was seeking to know if she was going to go, why didn't she go right away? Why were we given all of these incredible events leading up to? And there were a lot of answers. It gave time the, for the family to heal and to be prepared. It opened the abilities and the knowing for so many people in so many ways. The two most important lessons that I've learned from that process were one, none of us, no matter how unexpected it looks to everyone, cross over a second before our time. It's very important to know. So when we say somebody saved somebody lives, what really is happening is that, that it, it's not that person's life. Because of that, the universe, God, brings the person with capacity, ability, and skill to prolong that life. When you truly allow for yourself to know that what I'm saying is true, you can relax because that first wave of fear of what do I do? You, you cannot, you won't miss your death. You'll be there for it. So since we know it's for, <laughs> why don't we just trust that we will not be robbed of any breath of life that we're given? And then the very next breath we take is a relief. <sighs> okay, I get to live my life to the fullest. To me, it's a phenomenal realization. I'm going to live it to the fullest. That's That was the one thing that I knew. I knew that that little soul was not going to depart this planet until the very moment of its perfect divine timing. However you use the language to describe it, I describe it as divine timing. Divine moment of birth, divine moment of birth into a new realm, which we call death. Now that's number one. Number two, there were moments of healing on that journey of when she was still with us. As to where I saw the power of every intention, of every prayer, and every well-meant thought. We did a fast um, one of the days where people in Brazil were fasting for healing for her. As people on my team and my many students and clients who had ability to heal or to witness the healing or to create the space for healing, however you define healing, were doing it here. And as I was also participating in this, I was given a beautiful understanding and a vision. I was shown how the reality is formed through all of these sparks of light and that how every spark of light is a person's thought or prayer or intention. So they're never wasted. They're never wasted. Every time you think even send a good thought. If Just pick a person right now and think, I love you. That's all it is. You just send a gorgeous signal, electric signal, by the way, that is translated to the feeling of love towards them. You have helped to create them a new alternative reality of well-being. Now, when there is enough of those signals and they're aligned with a person's path, they expand into that new reality. It's a very high concept to understand, but it is a very simple and beautiful concept to feel. To know that every time you intentionally send your loving attention to someone, it matters. And if sometimes you don't get the outcome that you thought you were intending praying or meditating for, it is because that energy is put into a much higher outcome that might be inaccessible to us at this point. But at some point, either later in this life or, li or later in the life hereafter, we will know that not only our prayers are answered, not only manifestations are unfolded, but that it has happened in the most miraculous way. I know it with every fiber of my being. 
and you know and i want to pour it to someone who maybe is praying right now for something or meditating on something or journaling or manifesting and is wondering why is this not happening release that it is happening in a more miraculous way release the control allow the miracle release the control allow the miracle that's brilliant i mean i think a lot of us um in listening to you i i, I think that the, the one thing that sticks out to me is that a lot of times we will pray for something and we'll ask the universe for something and we don't always get what we what we ask for but it comes in a different form the way it was supposed to be you know mm -hmm. we may ask for i i want to i I mean, I, I'm not a very materialistic individual, so it's difficult for me to say, um, I want a new computer. I'm praying for a new computer. I'm praying for a new computer. But then I don't get a new computer. I get I get something that I never would have thought would have helped me. I, I get the program that's a better program than what I've been using, for example. Um, I mean, that's very simplistic. I had to think off the top of my head because in regard to us being able to connect to that want, that need, that prayer, asking our angels for help, um, asking our guardian angels for help, asking God for help, uh, or the or the source, whatever whichever you believe in, for help. Um, sometimes it doesn't always present itself. And I'm just validating what you're saying, at least um, making sure I understand mm -hmm. it correctly. Where we may not get exactly what we ask for. I want a chocolate or covered ice cream. Um, and instead, you get a vanilla ice cream, and and then you find out later that you're, if you'd have taken the chocolate ice cream, you're allergic to chocolate, and it would have caused you to choke, and you know, and you should be grateful that it switched to vanilla. Yeah, kind of a thing. I love that. I'm, I'm going kinda... to call it vanilla <laughs> manifesting, Michael. It is perfect <laughs> because if you know, if it's too complex, that one needs to sell it. It is no longer profound. So I, it's vanilla manifesting. I love it, and I will refer to you when I quote it as an example. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm, I feel really good. I contributed to that. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Um, you lost. You lost uh, eleven people in 2013. Mm-hmm. That, I mean, that's quite a journey with with loss. Um, obviously, you have created an environment for other individuals to help them through whatever they're going through, whether it be grief or loss or um, to promote and, and build their life in a more positive way from many different approaches. I think that you you have uh, mm -hmm. you have business people, you've got you've got numerous books that you have out on several different topics in regards to them. some of them we've put up on the thing here, but um your passion now i know you said you were in real estate and you were homeschooling your kids but your passion now is your company right and and what it mm -hmm. provides for people to help them through managing life right very much so very much so i think to sum it all up kind of you know um there are only two ways to live this life scared in this case scared of death or sacred, in this case, enjoying the sacredness of life. There are only two ways. Everything else in between is a bridge. There are just only two ways. And so I call them scared me and sacred me. And when you look at the letters, the letters are the same. And uh, the only difference is that the C is shifted. I call it the C of commitment. Mm. So every day, I help people to shift the commitment to live their life in sacred, not in scared. That's it. That's as, as simple as it gets. And as possibility coach, I say not only it's possible, it's possible for you, right? We all believe it's possible for someone, something, somewhere else, but it's possible yeah. for me. And this is how. That's in a nutshell what I'm so passionate about. Well, and realistically, possi possibility develops and presents hope. And mm -hmm. we all should have hope that life can be better, that we can do better that my tomorrow's better than today. We all have hope for that. So the possibility that that's, I mean, I love the way you present that possibility exists that tomorrow's going to be a better day. The possibility exists that my life's going to change today. Um, so yeah, I like that very much. So let's talk about your company a little bit and how somebody can get in touch with you. Uh, I know that you've got a number of books. I have them up there. And uh, you have some services as well that people can get involved in, as we just talked about. So if you can please share that with us, I would greatly appreciate it. 
Thank you. I think the three things that come to mind, um, it was Michael and I were chatting just before and I said, let's not overwhelm me or the listener with the volume of our pro products and services. So I am guided to share three things that I think are very timely. Um, you see a book that's called Pros for Me, and it's a book that talks about 35 universal laws to make money work for you. It's its job. It's money's job to frame the path for your sacred self. <laughs> so when people tell me I don't care for money, I'm concerned because I say, how about you love people enough to care for money so you can help more people, right? Brilliant. Money's just energy. Money's just energy. Let's just... What do you mean you don't care for money? It's energy. Do you care for energy? Start caring for energy because every time you say I don't care for money, money, time, and so resources are not three different things. They're all energy. They're management of energy. So if I care for energy, I'm going to be careful with my time and money wise, full of care, right? It doesn't mean it gets to possess me. It has nothing to do with becoming greedy. So anyway, that's just a whole concept. So for that book, we have an amazing quiz. If you go to moneyquiz.me, yes, I'm very repetitive with me, but it's moneyquiz.me. And what it does, it tells you what your money healing mode is. When you take the quiz, it'll tell you your main driving emotion, main value in life, and it'll tell you which three laws you want to start mastering. And that's just a great map into the book and then if you love the quiz you can of course get the book you can get it on amazon i believe it's under five dollars on kindle but you can get audio whatever you choose to do with prosper me but i would invite you instead of grabbing the book take the quiz first it's free and it invites you into the book in a very different way so it's moneyquiz.me another resource that came to mind um is related to the heaven is for everyone book that's on on the screen if you're watching if not that's yeah, that is on the screen that book was an inspiration of daily affirmations that i did for a year for free affirmations for one of the groups i did and then i took those and with my incredible team we put it into master dash me app i believe that app is three dollars one time only i think that is all it is and what it does it takes you through 52 virtues one virtue per week that are tied to your calendar. I think um, the, the the girl who has developed the app is looking how to make it an alarm so you can wake up to the daily virtue as an affirmation. You know, we'll probably do that when that is ready. But that, that app, Master-Me, what we're doing right now with my incredible team of coaches, Eastern time in US every Wednesday, right now at 8 p.m., but it might shift, they're doing a bit they're doing programs to clear the blocks to benefit from living that virtue example so it makes sense you pay 11 dollars tonight we're recording it on ways i don't know where you're listening to it but we're doing belonging what do i mean by clearing our subconscious mind can see belonging in two ways the scared mind see it, sees it as be longing we're constantly longing for something. We're longing for money. We're longing for relationships. We're longing for insight. The issue is if we're in longing, we don't have it. So we're shifting it to be longing, one word, very powerful. So that's the master dash me app. And to put it all into one thing of miracles, grab the free master class at manifestmiracles.me so those are the three things that came moneyquiz.me master-me app empower-me app and manifestmiracles.me whoops dot me i put the wrong thing on there i'm making sure i have those so we have them in the notes thank you um victoria this has been like a fantastic conversation i really appreciate you sharing your journey with us i think that um what you have been through and then turning that into such a positive that helped people move forward in life in a very positive way is a wonderful contribution to humanity as a whole. Um, I hope that we are able to uh, educate people, inspire some people and motivate some people in regard to understanding loss uh, is brief and that life is eternal and um, that that presentation is 
us taking the possibility of what exists beyond and what exists in our life and how we can take that to the next level. So thank you very much for being here. Thank you for having me and for summarizing it in such profound way. Absolutely. I, we have to have another conversation. We have so much more to talk about. Of course, 35 laws. That can be a regular. <laughs> Absolutely. Victoria, thank you very much. And um, I will talk to you hopefully very soon. Thank you. Thanks for listening to this episode of One More Thing Before You Go. Check out our website at beforeyougopodcast.com. You can find us as well as subscribe to the program and rate us on your favorite podcast listening platform.